The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to Graph Analytics, Graph Algorithms inside Neo4j with Mark Needham. Just a brief note about eSynergy before the presentation. eSynergy specializes in open source and cloud recruitment. If you're looking for a new opportunity or want to build out your team, please get in touch after the webinar. Now moving on to some housekeeping. If you have any questions for Mark, please fire them over via the questions box throughout and Mark will answer them at the end of his talk. We are recording the session and the slides and recording will be made available and sent to you tomorrow by email along with my contact details. Now I'm going to pass over to Mark to begin the talk. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. So, yeah, so we're going to be doing uh, for the next uh, 45 minutes. So we're going to be talking about uh, graph algorithms and Neo4j. Uh, so just a quick uh, intro to me in case you want to ask me any questions afterwards or anything like that. Uh, my details are at the bottom. You can either email me or I'm on Twitter at that handle. Uh, and you can see on the top our rough agenda for what we're going to do over the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, so we're going to do a bit of background, like what is uh, what is graph analytics, what are graph algorithms, um, why are they become interesting now? That will be the first uh, half of the talk, and then in the second half we'll look at uh, how do we run those uh, analytics and those algorithms, uh, and I'll show you some examples and uh, and explain a bit how we've gone about implementing it. Uh, for this talk, I'm going to assume that you have some familiarity with graphs and graph databases, so we'll start from, from that point. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so if you're, if you're familiar with, with graphs, um, you'll, you'll be aware that in, uh, in networks, connections are the most uh, prevalent attribute uh, of those. Uh, and that's why graph algorithms are really, uh, are really an interesting area and quite an exciting area uh, of... Uh, to study because they help us to understand uh, those networks. But, I mean, the network can be could be anything. It could be a, a network of IT uh, infrastructure. It could be a network, uh, a social network, um, and we can store a lot of that a lot of that data explicitly. But uh, graph algorithms help us uncover like what is what exactly is going on there um, in, in between the connections between the pieces of data, uh, and we can then use those insights to to make predictions uh, or to make suggestions for actions that that our users might want to do. And so if we think what we're trying to do when we're looking at networks, we're trying to understand uh, complexity and emerging behaviors. Uh, for example, how things spread in a network. Uh, and so that could be uh, several things. It could be the paths, pathways that information or failures take through a network. Uh, perhaps it's how uh, data flows through a network and the capacity uh, to transport uh, that data. Uh, and the third one on the, on the right hand side is uh, the influences of group dynamics and resiliency. So we'll just take a quick look at a, a real world example of each of these uh, types of um, analytics. So what we've got here is a, uh, a look at a, a visualization showing delay propagation in a US transport network. And so this is a good one for analyzing what we call propagation paths, uh, where we're trying to understand the routes taken by network failure. Uh, so this is from a 2010 data set on it, uh, where there was a big uh, congestion problem uh, amongst flights in the US. Uh, and the purple dots are indicating uh, where there were ser serious delays, and the green ones are where uh, everything's a bit more OK. Uh, so if you have a time sequence, you can see the cascading rippling failures and the key connections spreading from uh, spreading that delay from the east uh, coast uh, to the west coast. There's a bit of a knock-on effect. And so that's just one example using flights, but we could easily be using uh, perhaps an IT network when we're trying to uh, contain a virus that's got onto our network, uh, or perhaps an electrical uh, grid where there's been a surge of electricity or something like that. Or maybe we want to do it the other way around. We actually want to work out how can we spread some information through a social network and we need to know uh, where exactly should we be focusing uh, in the network. Uh, next, we're going to have a look at another example. So here we've got uh, flight delays, so another variant of, of flights. Uh, and flight delays have a big uh, economic impact in the US. So they lose up, uh, up to $40 billion uh, dollars a year uh, 
based on this. Um, and so they need to try and figure out how can they reduce the passengers' loss of time, stop the decreased productivity that happens with missed flights uh, and, and the missed opportunities around that. Uh, and so this map is showing um, uh, showing an, an example uh, of, uh, of doing that. Uh, and so here we're using the flow and, uh, and dynamics uh, type uh, analytics to help us um, to help us explore this uh, this network. Uh, and, our, and our goal is can we figure out how to do least cost uh, least cost routing on, on this one? Uh, so we want to work out. Uh, let's imagine we're routing a call from from one point to another one, and there's a lot of different routes uh, that it could go through. Uh, we want to pick, uh, and it might vary even, maybe it's not even a best route, uh, uh, not even a generally best route, but it varies by the time of the day, uh, quality, service levels, uh, and even whether or not the, the call has priority. Uh, and so if we evaluate all those options using uh, using analytics, we can help to to, uh, to come up with the best route through the network. And then, so that's the second one, second type. Uh, and then finally, we've got uh, We've got what we call bridge uh, points. So this one, this uh, diagram here is an example um, of using what we call community detection algorithms, and it was done on a, a Belgian telecoms network. Uh, so it's showing all the calls that are being made by different people, uh, and you can see that they fall into very specific clusters. So the ones in the red cluster are, are calls from French speakers, and the ones in the green, uh, the green, green coloured nodes are Dutch speakers. Uh, and you can see that there's lots of calls between people with the same uh, in the same language. There's lots of calls in between the ones in the red on the left and the green on the right. Uh, but then there's also another one down in the bottom right hand side where there's a cluster of um, uh, of people who are mixed uh, mixed languages. Um, and so this type of thing we were using it here for telecoms networks. Maybe it could be used instead for detecting. Um, it, fraud in fraud networks. So who are the accomplices of, 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 a, uh, of a person trying to commit fraud? Uh, or it might be used in biology to help us understand how to better target uh, a disease. And so all of these uh, types of analysis, graph algorithms sit behind them. Uh, we can use these algorithms to, um, to, help, uh, to help figure out what's going on. So how exactly uh, does that work? So, uh, so the field is kind of being called graph analytics, or, or sometimes you'll see it uh, just referred to as uh, graph algorithms, but everything is based around how can we use connections uh, to help solve uh, real world problems. Uh, and you might wonder if you've been following this uh, this field for a while, why has it taken so long? So um, this is a, a picture of Leonard Euler, who was the creator of the field of uh, graph theory. Uh, and you can see it was a, it's a long time ago. So it's back in the, in the 18th century uh, when he first came up with the idea of uh, modeling data as uh, graphs. Uh, but it wasn't until 200 years after that, in 1936, that the first uh, graph textbook was published. And then it took until the 70s and 80s for network science to, to, to come, come apart as a, come around as a discipline. Uh, and that's sort of the starting point of where graph analytics uh, started to emerge. Uh, but in the last couple of years, we've really started to see uh, people get more into this. And we've seen uh, companies uh, relying on graphs, so, such as Google, LinkedIn, Uber, eBay, they're all using uh, graphs in, in some way, even if it's not specifically a graph database. And so what makes it really work well now is that we've kind of reached this uh, point of critical mass. So there's now, people are collecting a massive amount of connected data, and the idea of connecting data points together is now becoming a much more uh, common thing in, uh, in businesses. Uh, there's, it's now becoming uh, common to be able to see the, uh, the structure uh, in data. So often in the, in the first wave of, of big data, people were just collecting pieces of data, but they were not necessarily looking at, at how it was connected together. And so this has become, become much more common uh, recently. We've got the existing mathematical tools, so people have been uh, have been sort of working uh, working to make these work with, uh, with bigger data sets. So we've already got the maths behind it, now we just need to uh, to extend that to work with these bigger data sets. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, we can now fulfill the promise, uh, the unfulfilled promises of, of big data. Um, so I'm going to go now, now, now we're going to look in a bit more detail about some of the stuff we, uh, we've been doing with uh, Neo4j in this area. So the underlying idea with all of the, with graph analytics and graph algorithms is that they're, uh, they're helping us to get some insight into our data. So on the slide here, we've got 
a diagram showing what could be like an e-commerce uh, website, for example. And so we've got some people and they know each other, so that maybe there's a bit of a social network in there. They might have bought some items. Uh, we've also then collected some information about their browsing habits. So we've collected, we've got some indication of what might be in their shopping basket or pages that they've looked at. Uh, and so we've got a graph of all that information. Uh, but there's probably some hidden structure uh, underlying that that we can't see. Perhaps the there's a very important shopper in the network, or perhaps there's a certain set of people who who, who shop in very similar ways. Uh, um, we can't see that just from the raw data, so we uh, we want to try and gain find that hidden structure with the help of some algorithms. Uh, and so we see the insight that people are getting from algorithms in general tends to fall into two categories roughly. On the right hand side, we have machine learning uh, approaches. Um, as you can see, we've got some of the machine learning algorithms on that side. So you could be running a classification or regression algorithm, maybe a data set, or maybe um, even more recently, people are doing a lot of stuff with neural networks, um, text analysis as well. Uh, and then where we're going to sit for the next half an hour or so is on the right hand side of this diagram. So we're looking at graph algorithms to help either find important nodes, find uh, ones that are most relevant cluster nodes together and, and generally find structural insights into our data. Um, and so these are, this diagram here is just showing sh some of the ways that data can, that structural uh, can hide uh, inside uh, inside a graph. So on the, the left hand side, we've got a, uh, we've got a diagram showing uh, the malaria uh, parasite. Uh, in the middle, uh, we've got um, just, a, just a, a simple graph showing uh, how data can be structured based on hierarchy. Uh, and then on the right hand side, we've got another another look at, at how um, how data can be structured based on uh, applying clustering coefficients and short path lengths uh, to a data set. And so the one on the top actually looks quite similar to our to our telecom network. And so this is what we're going to try and do. This is what the graph algorithm should help us find. If there's some structure in there, we, we, we should be able to find a way that we can run the algorithm to find the structure. Uh, one really cool data set that I've seen uh, this uh, approach applied is uh, the Graph of Thrones. So this is a, a data set based on the Game of Thrones books. So there's a, a professor called uh, Andrew Beveridge at one of the universities in the United States. Uh, and he has OCR scanned in all the uh, Game of Thrones books. Uh, it's got all the text. Uh, and then he's built a, uh, an interaction graph of all the people, all the characters in Game of Thrones, based on them appearing uh, 10 to 15 characters away from each other. So if, if two people appear within 15 characters in the text, then we count that as one interaction. And so we build up uh, an interaction graph that contains 187 characters, 684 relationships between them, uh, and then there are that, those relationships are capturing uh, 7,000 interactions. Uh, Andrew then runs, uh, these are some examples of graph algorithms that you can run over it. So he runs going from the left, so degree uh, centrality. So this is just counting how many uh, outbound or how many relationships do you have uh, connecting to you. So on this one, Tyrion interacts with the most people. We've then got weighted degree, which is uh, counting not only how many people you interacted with, but how many times in total did you interact. And that's quite kind of similar to the, to the first one. Uh, we've then got eigenvector uh, centrality, we've got page rank, we've got closeness centrality, and we've got between the centrality. All of those are, are, are slight uh, variations of finding uh, influence. All, all, in fact, all of them on here are, are trying to work out who's the, who are the most influential characters uh, in the book, and they all have some slightly different characteristics too. Uh, but we'll go into more detail on those in a second. So how do we? How would we go about doing this? So Andrew Beveridge, in that example, was doing all of his work in in R. Uh, so he's working with CSV files and in R. Um, but if we were, there, there are lots of other options as well. So we might choose to use some existing data processing tools. So we could be using, uh, maybe we're using Spark with GraphX or Flink with Jelly. Um, perhaps we're using a, a dedicated graph processing tool. Maybe we're using GraphLab or Giraffe. Um, or uh, like what Andrew was doing, maybe we're using a specific tool uh, in our data scientist toolkit. So uh, we could be using iGraph or NetworkX, or there's also a tool called Boost uh, that's available as well. So any of these tools, uh, they, they all uh, do reasonably uh, reasonably similar things. Um, 
the annoying thing about them is that there are, there are lots of them, uh, and so you have to figure out uh, which one am I going to learn. Um, uh, and whichever one you learn, you've got to figure out how do I get my data in there, uh, and how do I can I then write back those results somewhere, or can or or how what am I going to do with the, with the results of that? Am I just storing it in a CSV file and doing some processing on that? Um, and especially with the classic data science tools, uh, they don't necessarily scale very well as our as our data sets get uh, get bigger. Um, and so we actually have an example from a previous uh, Graph Connect at the uh, Near 4 J conference. Um, there was a presentation in twenty, I think it was in twenty sixteen. Uh, John Swain from Right Relevance was showing how to do Twitter analytics on uh, our favourite topic in UK politics, the uh, Brexit vote uh, of mid-2016. And so you can see here, this is a diagram that he created using a visualisation tool called Gephi, uh, and is kind of uh, coloured uh, anyone who was on the leave side in green and anyone who was on the remain side in purple. Uh, and then the connections, then you can see uh, the, the interactions between the uh, between the people are, uh, are the, the sort of arcs uh, on the diagram. Uh, and it kind of shows mostly uh, people talking about remain are mostly talking with people from remain. Uh, people from leave mostly talking about leave and there's very few people um, sitting in between, uh, which is often what you find um, when uh, when the Twitter conversation app uh, conversation happens, which I guess is where the the idea of the Twitter echo chamber comes from. So I just want to have a look. How did they go about building this this tool? So this is how this is the the workflow. So if we go from the left hand side, so we've got the Twitter streaming API. So we get our we're using that from a Python tool. We take the tweets, we put them in RabbitMQ, and then storing the full tweet in Mongo. They then store some of the data in Neo. They're loading it out, running some analysis using the iGraph library in R, then storing some stuff in MySQL and analyzing it in Tableau, um, and then exporting it to um, a graph format called GraphML to do some graph visualization on it. And so there's quite a lot of steps uh, to get this to work. Um, but if you, know, I mean, if you know all the tools, then it's okay. Uh, but what we wanted to try and do was figure out, can we actually make it, make it simpler for people so that they can if they've got their data in NIFJ, um, can we make it really easy for them to then uh, run these algorithms uh, and get the results so that they can go and visualize or uh, view them in a, a BI tool such as Tableau? Uh, so that's where we have um, the NIFJ graph algorithms library. Uh, and so we see, we started to see people, so originally Neo4j was being used a lot for transactional workloads. So you'd typically see it being used as the back end for a database that was on a website, for example, doing, and we're just doing uh, real-time real -time queries uh, in the request response cycle um, of a website or a mobile phone application. Uh, and, there, and, and what we've seen in the last year or so is people trying to figure out, can I use this to do analytics? And a lot of the the tools were already there. So we've got the Cypher query language, which makes it really easy for, for uh, people to pick up uh, graph querying, um, even if they're not necessarily developers. I've seen uh, people being able to, to write Cypher queries quite uh, easily. Uh, we've got a procedures library called APOX, that stands for Awesome Procedures on Cypher. And so that allows us to, uh, to do uh, data cleaning or run any utility functions uh, on the FJ. Uh, we've then got analytics integrations with different tools such as uh, Tableau, as we saw on the previous page. Uh, and Neo4j is a native graph database, so it's basically graphs all the way down and it's optimized uh, for those types of workloads. Uh, and then the, the last bit is what we've got down here on the bottom of the screen. So this is the, the graph algorithms library uh, that we started uh, working on in the spring uh, last year uh, and was first released in July uh, 2017. Uh, and so that's where we're going to focus now. Uh, and the, the library gives us three different types of algorithms which match exactly the types of analysis that we were talking about at the beginning of this session. So at the top, we've got path finding. So here we're trying to find optimal paths uh, or, find, or evaluate root availability or quality. And these are your classic uh, algorithms. Often these are the ones that people are most familiar with when they think of uh, graph algorithms. So it's like, for example, find me the shortest path 
that takes me from Blackfriars Station to Luton Airport. Like, what's the fastest route I can do? Uh, I can do that, uh, and maybe I'm going to take into account the weights. Uh, the weights in this case might be how long it takes to go between each station. But find me the, the route that I should take. And so tools like Google Maps or City Mapper would be using this type of algorithm. On the bottom right hand side, we've got community detection. Uh, you'll sometimes see this referred to as clustering, uh, and here we're trying to work out how is how are how can a group of nodes be clustered or partitioned so those are other words you might see uh, used there uh, and that might be used uh, for example in our belgian telephone uh, network to work out like what what type what's our what does our customer base look like uh, i've used it more recently on a on a yelp data set so yelp has um a bunch of of categories that businesses can can fall under but the categories themselves don't come under any hierarchy uh, but you can actually use community detection to work out which categories uh, are actually most similar to each other. Uh, and then finally, if we come over to the left hand side, we've got centrality. Uh, these algorithms are being used to work out the importance of nodes in a network. Um, and the most famous one in here is the page rank uh, algorithm. So this is used or a variant of it is used by Google to help rank um, so, uh, web, the web pages that come back when you uh, when you search for a, a specific thing. Uh, and there are other ones under here as well. So those are the ones that we saw used on that uh, Game of Thrones network. So how do we use these things uh, from EFJ? So all of them are available as cipher procedures. Um, and we effectively, each of them takes in a, what we call a specification and a configuration. Uh, and you can see a couple of examples on, uh, on here. Uh, and we can either call them using uh, a stream variant or we can do a non-stream variant. So if we just go through the stream variant. So the way this one works is we say I want it to so call is the syntax for executing a cipher procedure. And all of the algorithms have the prefix algo dot then the name of the algorithm. So for example, dot page rank. Uh, and then they'll either that will be the, the right version or they might have a dot stream and that will be the streaming version. And you see here, we can then pass in a label. So like a node label, so for example, it could be a person. And then maybe the type would be friends. And then there's some configuration values that we can pass in. So that's just a map of, uh, of config. Uh, and this version will return us a node ID. So the, the algorithms are, are, mass, are really optimized uh, to take up minimal amounts of memory so that you can run these on big graphs. Uh, so we get a node ID, which is just an in, uh, internal representation of a node, uh, and we get a score. And so the score will be uh, will change depending on which algorithm you run. So perhaps it's going to be a page rank score, or it's going to be a closeness centrality score, uh, or if you're running one of the community detection algorithms, perhaps it's going to be a, a label instead. So it's going to say this node is in this uh, maps to this label, this node maps to another label. Uh, we can, and that, that, those ones are just sending you back the results, so they're not making any changes to the to the database. If you want to, uh, there's also a non-streaming uh, variant, and those ones uh, will actually write the results into the database. So they'll, for example, go and store a, a property on every node with the result of running the algorithm. Uh, and again, we can pass in the configuration to those. So that works quite well. Those two approaches are, are, are good for, for running algorithms against the big, like against the whole graph. So if we want to go, I want to go against this label everywhere and with this specific relationship type, uh, that works great. Uh, but sometimes we might want to run algorithms against just a, against a subset of a graph, so a subgraph. Uh, and for that use case, we can change the way we pass in the specification so that instead of specifying a node label and a relationship type, uh, we can actually specify cipher queries to do this and we run the algorithm over what we call a projected graph uh, and the projected graph will contain the the nodes that are returned in this first query so we return node id so whatever nodes you want to run it on you return those there uh, and then you need to indicate well how are the nodes that were in the first section how are they connected and so that's what the second query is doing here and this is a very simple one so it's just i mean in this case we're getting all the nodes in the graph anyway uh, but what you typically have there is a more specific cipher query that uh, that indicates what, what exactly what what subgraph you want to run the algorithms on uh, so now let's just zoom in and see how would we how does how does this work so what comes under each uh, category so under centrality at the moment we've got uh, we've got page rank uh, we've got betweenness we've got closeness uh, and then degree is actually one that you can just run directly in cipher so you don't even need a, a graph algorithm to do that 
Community detection has label propagation, union find, or sometimes called weakly connected components, strongly connected components, uh, Louvain, and then triangle count and clustering coefficient. And so each of these capture different different metrics uh, of, uh, of a community that might be interesting, uh, depending on our domain. And then finally, we've got pathfinding. Uh, so some of these are available in, in Cypher directly, um, but these ones here are optimized for running in parallel. Um, and so they'll often be uh, be quicker than the, the inbuilt stuff. And so what we've got here is single source shortest path. So we're saying um, either I want to find uh, all the, the path from this node to everybody else, or maybe it's from this node to another node. Uh, we can do all nodes, uh, single shortest path. So it's finding like the distance, the, the shortest path between every single pair of nodes. Uh, and we can do parallel. And underlying these are parallel breadth and depth first searches. Uh, okay. Uh, and the idea here is that with all of these, uh, we should now we should be able to iterate uh, very quickly, uh, and we want to enrich our data with the with the results uh, from the algorithms, uh, and then plug them into any other APIs and tools that we're using. So I'm just going to show you some examples of how we would how we could go about running these now. So we've got three data sets that I'll show you some examples from. So we've got a Yelp business graph. So this is based on the Yelp data set challenge. So Yelp release a data set every summer. Uh, I think they're on competition number 11. So they release uh, data from 11 cities uh, this year at least. Uh, and they have the businesses, they have reviews, they have users, they have tips, they have check-ins, they have all, the, all different types of information. DBpedia is the structural version of Wikipedia. So we don't have the free text, but we have all the links between the pages. Uh, and then Bitcoin, I guess, is, is, is a well-known uh, cryptocurrency. And there we've got the whole of uh, Bitcoin in the FJ, and that contains 1.7 billion nodes and then 2.7 billion relationships between them. So we'll start with DBpedia. Um, so as I said, this is a shallow copy of Wikipedia, and all we've got in this graph is uh, links between pages. Uh, and so what we might want to do here is say, well, can you tell me what the most important page is in the whole graph? Uh, and this is how we would run it. So we're saying, okay, call the uh, page rank algorithm, get back the, the node and the score, uh, and then order it by the score descending and show me the top five results. Uh, and then you can see on the right hand side what we get back. So we get United States is the most important page, page rank wise. Um, animal is the next, obviously a very generic uh, one in second place then France, and then we've got a couple of other results after that. A nice thing we can do with DBpedia is we could actually run uh, algorithms on subsets of it. So maybe we want to run uh, this algorithm only on pages that contain the word Europe and see what, what, what's the, what, what important pages do we have there. We can also use it to find clusters. So we might want to uh, run it over the whole graph and see what clusters exist in our data set. So we could run a label propagation algorithm, and that will then store a property called partition that you can see on the second query that we run. Uh, and what we might do then is say, okay, I'm going to run a query that groups my nodes by partition. That's what we're doing in this second part of the query. Uh, and then find me the most important nodes uh, in uh, each of those. Um, in each of those partitions. Um, so the grouping here might indicate, okay, there are some effectively when you're, sorry, when you're doing a clustering, you're saying that nodes that fit in the same cluster are more densely connected with each other than they are uh, with anybody else outside of the cluster. Um, so, so that would indicate these pages are, are more similar to each other than they are to other pages in the, in the data set. Next up, let's have a quick look at the Yelp data set. So Yelp has business reviews by users, businesses can have categories and locations, users can have friends. Uh, so here we're going to do some uh, we're going to do some graph projections. So what we actually have is users to businesses, but we can uh, actually come up with a user to user or business to business similarity graph uh, by using that user to business relationship. So this is what the it's often quite helpful just to do a bit of uh, quick uh, exploratory analysis before we start doing anything. And so these queries here. Uh, can be used to work out what's the average uh, rating of some of the by, by some of the users. And so we've got standard deviation, we've got the maximum number of reviews that people have done, the maximum ratings they've given, how funny they are. And then on the second part of the second query on this page, we're showing uh, how many reviews were done in each year. 
Uh, so you can see it was increasing. The, the peak was in 2011. Hard to say whether this is the general peak of Yelp or this is just the data they've exposed to us, but that, that's what we have in this data set. We can then run uh, PageRank over the uh, Yelp social graph. So Yelp has uh, its own social network, so you can have friend people. Um, in this case, friends, if I, I can request to be your friend, uh, and you have to accept it. So it's kind of a, a two-way relationship uh, between us. Uh, and we can run this and find out who are the most influential people in the in the Yelp network. Um, and once we have that result, maybe we then choose to use it when we are sorting reviews. So perhaps when we're on the the, the, the page for a specific business, if that happens to be a business that Philip has reviewed, then maybe we decide, okay, well, Philip's a very influential user on Yelp, so we should show the review that Philip wrote at, at the top. Uh, so we can potentially use these scores um, as a nice way of, um, of filtering information uh, that we show to our users. We can then, so if we go back to the inferred network idea, uh, we can create relationships between users based on them reviewing the same businesses. Uh, and we can do the same uh, for businesses based on them being reviewed by the same people. Uh, and we might use this to help us find, can we find similar businesses or can we find groups of similar people? Uh, or even are there some interests that are similar? Uh, and so this is how we might, uh, we might run such an algorithm. So here we're saying I want to find <coughs> businesses in Las Vegas where there's uh, been more than five reviews. And then I want to find um, the, the kind of businesses that have been reviewed by the same people uh, in the second bit where the star rating was the same. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to put an extra label on these nodes so that I only bother looking at businesses in Las Vegas uh, and not anyone else. So we do that, and that, that's just uh, some pre-processing work on our, on our graph. And um, we can then run the union find algorithm. So this one is a community detection algorithm that tries to work out if there are any clusters between the businesses based on uh, co-reviews. And you can see in this case, this actually doesn't really reveal anything interesting at all. It just tells us that almost everything is really strongly uh, connected to each other. Uh, and when you see this sort of result, uh, we probably need to go back and look at the underlying graph that we're running it on, because uh, in this case, we've probably got maybe our, uh, our bar for what we considered uh, a relationship in the projected graph between the nodes is too uh, is too uh, lenient uh, and it's actually connecting basically connecting everything together so maybe we want to put more of a, a limit on that so maybe we say okay well I'm not going to consider two businesses similar to each other unless they've got more than five common reviews or unless they've got more than 10% common reviews or some other metric like that now, otherwise you end up where well, you can end up with results like this uh, so this is one thing always to keep in mind when you're running these algorithms don't just uh, don't just run it on the, the the data set and then assume the answer is going to be amazing actually um, ch check what what graph you're running it on as well uh, we can also run page rank uh, over those las vegas based businesses uh, and perhaps unsurprisingly this tells us that the airport uh, is the is the most influential notes this was kind of at the center of the uh, the reviews network uh, and then there are seem to be a few uh, fast food places in the top five as well uh, and you can see it doesn't take very long to, to run these uh, to run these queries. This is all the businesses in Las Vegas. It's only taken seven seconds to, to calculate that. Okay, last we're going to have a quick look at Bitcoin. So Greg Walker from LearnMeABitcoin.com, uh, there's a website for teaching people how the Bitcoin works, uh, has created a database with a full copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and so, like I said before, so 1.7 billion nodes, 2.7 billion relationships. Um, and this is capturing things such as blocks, transactions, addresses, and outputs. Um, and at the time I created the slide, 600 uh, gig on disk. Uh, it may well be bigger than that now. Uh, and it updates every 10 minutes when data comes in from Bitcoin. Um, so this is what the graph uh, looks like. So we've got uh, some blocks, we've got transactions, we've got outputs, we've got addresses, we've got a mempool. Which is where the uh, web, um, transactions go uh, while they're in transition. Uh, and then we've got Coinbase at the top. So it's not too complicated, the structure we've got in here. Now uh, we might want to just do a quick check like what is the distribution of locked relationships uh, in the graph? So you can see there's an 
nearly like the 99 percentile is two uh, but then there are some really massive uh, nodes which have uh, loads of, uh, of locked relationships on yeah, so it's a very uh, long tail graph uh, and what we might want to do is then work out are there clusters of, uh, of addresses in here and this is not a perfect one for trying to find this because um, because people often don't use the same wallet between uh, between transactions to avoid uh, people knowing uh, who has a lot of Bitcoin. Um, but it does find uh, it finds I mean it finds one massive cluster that, that a lot of the uh, the outputs are in. Uh, but then there are some smaller ones as well. Uh, and so we could use this perhaps as a just as an exploration starting point to to help us uh, narrow in where we should look rather than having to explore the whole of uh, the Bitcoin network. Um, now I want to have a quick look at the implementation behind this to so just explain to you a bit how, how it's been built. So first, this is the, the architecture of the library. Um, so we, we load the data in parallel from the FJ. Uh, we're then running, uh, storing it in efficient in-memory uh, data structures. So as I mentioned before, we're only using uh, identifiers for the nodes. So we're not loading all the information for every node. So none of the properties are loaded, for example, it's just a, yeah, either an integer or long value representing it. We're then running the graph algorithms in parallel uh, using the using a, a graph API. So this is a API that uh, anybody could, would be free to implement their own graph algorithms on. Uh, and then if we're using the write back result, we're then writing back those results into the database in parallel. Or of course, we might be streaming them back to the uh, back to the client. And the, the nice thing with the with this approach is that we can, if we run it on a bigger uh, on a machine with more CPUs, uh, it will run it will run quicker. Uh, and the idea is uh, to make all those CPU bars in the top uh, command green. Um, so this uh, print screen here is from uh, one I was running earlier on uh, on DBpedia, uh, and you can see it runs. It's running on a a machine with 144 cores. So you can get ones like the. Uh, nowadays from Amazon in case you want to you, you want to try it out and see uh, how fast it can go uh, but you can actually do some some reasonable stuff uh, just on your uh, on your laptop uh, so you don't necessarily have to get a massive machine to get started with it uh, we did so we've done a bit of comparison uh, against uh, a Twitter 2010 data set uh, that was um, the benchmark seemed to be uh, running on uh, Sparks GraphX, um, and so this is on. You can see on the bottom hand, bottom part of the slide, uh, a bit of an explanation about the hardware setup. So uh, we were running this on a 55 gigabyte RAM machine with 128 CPUs, and you can see that it's uh, it's a lot faster to work out um, the, the results for both of these community detection and centrality algorithms. Uh, and uh, there's actually, if you're, if you're interested in the, the idea of running stuff on a single machine uh, in more detail. Uh, uh, there's a researcher called Frank McSherry yeah, who wrote a lot about this stuff and so we got uh, quite a bit of inspiration from reading his blog posts uh, where he was wondering why does everything uh, have to be run on a on a massive cluster can't I do uh, clever stuff just on a single machine uh, so to, to wrap up uh, the talk um, how can you try this out if you're intrigued and want to and want to give it a give it a go so uh, we've made, um, in case you've never used Neo4j before, we've got the concept of the Neo4j sandbox. If you go to neo4j.com forward slash sandbox, you can create um, a Docker, Docker container. Um, I mean, you don't, need, you don't see the document. So we've basically got hosted uh, instances of Neo4j with uh, preloaded data sets uh, on there for you to play around with. Uh, and for each of them, there's also a walkthrough guide uh, talking you through how to, how to uh, how to analyze that data uh, and so on there now we've got a graph algorithms one uh, which actually lets you go through that game of thrones data set that i described earlier uh, and run different graph algorithms on it to see uh, how the characters uh, influence um, waxed and waned uh, as uh, as the books go by and uh, probably more more uh, interestingly as they uh, make politically bad decisions or uh, end up being uh, killed probably as well so that's that's a good place to start. Um, if you're downloading Neo4j um, today, you will get a tool called the Neo4j desktop, uh, and I've got a, a, a screenshot of that on the screen at the moment. Uh, and you can see, so what you get, you get uh, in the middle, we've got a database. We have at the top, we have some applications. So for example, the Neo4j browser would be one of them. 
Uh, and at the bottom of the screen, there is a, a place where we can install any plugins. Um, and so you can install the awesome procedures on Cypher plugin that I mentioned, and you can also install the graph elements. And so that, that's a very easy way to get uh, to get going as well. Uh, so I guess, uh, and yes, yeah, so you can see, you can just click on that button uh, and you can install it. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm just going to point you to some some links if you want to if you want to read more or depend, depending on what exactly you want to do if you want to go and have a look at the code uh, it's available on that second link the NIFT graph algorithms uh, repository uh, if you need uh, if you're using this and you want some quick um, feedback uh, or help uh, you can join our neofj.com slack and uh, you can go to the neofj graph algorithms uh, channel uh, and finally, if you want to just read something which shows, uh, which explains some use cases of how each of these algorithms can be used, uh, we have a white paper available at uh, nifj.com forward slash graph analytics. And with that, I guess it's time for some questions. So let me, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to just fire them over the questions box below um, for Mark. Um, I'll give everybody a couple of minutes. It doesn't appear to have that we have any questions. If anybody wants to contact Mark directly, um, we'll send in his details in a follow-up email. Um, but thank you so much for joining the session, um, and we'll contact you tomorrow with the recording. Thank you. Bye.